There's no Kristaps. There's no Jamal. There's no Joker. We got a problem, don't we? By the way, yes, this is a fan. Hello, I'm at Ryan, and today we will be talking about the star issue at the FIBA World Cup that's coming up across Japan, Indonesia, and of course Philippines, where we'll be going to do our coverage from. And by we, I mean me, because it's the Royal We. But just before we get to that, one big, big favour to ask you, as regulars on this channel will know, we are on the drive to 1,000. That's the point where YouTube is supposed to start paying us. And basically, we're trying to hit that so that any money we get from that from that from YouTube will essentially we're talking even small tiny checks at seventy dollars a month once that will go back into essentially getting us better equipment so you won't have sound issues anymore we hope and we I might even get a chance to actually learn how to edit or pay someone to edit if we get enough money for that but that's that's a goal long term so if you haven't already please subscribe and ring the bell so you get these as soon as you can but let's get right to the meat of it. Like, there's a star issue at this World Cup. A lot of the biggest names have pulled out. Some later than others, some very expected, some a little less expected. So, just to give the quick rundown of the names that you've been hearing a lot of lately, it's Jamal Murray, probably the most recent, uh, pull out of Team Canada. Kristaps Porzingis, a couple of days before him, or day before him, in fact, from Team Latvia. Or Latvia, because it's only really Canada and USA that used a team thing before them. No offence, just we're European. Um, obviously, Yanis was uh, a few days before that. Yanis was somewhat expected, in fairness. Nikola Jokic's withdrawal was also kind of expected, although we're going to get to the reasons behind the kind of expected withdrawals as well at some point here, don't worry, in this video. But essentially, what you're left with is some still very good players, but not as many of the superstars as say, we even had at Eurobasket last year. Like last year at Eurobasket, we had Yanis, we had Jokic. Jokic. Uh, you know, two huge names. If Latvia had qualified, we would have had Kristaps. Kristaps did play the World Cup qualifiers. They're on around the same time. So three players who are not at this tournament were at that. So that's quite a lot. Now, obviously, we have Luka Doncic, which is great. We have Rudy Gobert, also great. Uh, you know, there's Shea Gilders Alexander, also great. You notice the nationality I've not been mentioning. USA. And that really is where this problem well, not begins. The, the problem begins is actually in our second part of this video. We're still in the first. But a sort of why the USA is doing that is going to be important. So USA has obviously gone for still a very good roster. There's some very good players. I personally think Anthony Edwards is one of the most underrated players in the NBA. Well, no, I don't. Because we've all he's at that stage where he's so under, underrated, he's overrated. He's a very, very good player who's going to be a very good player for a very long time, I think. But this isn't the absolute, this isn't the Olympic roster ascending next year, for example, to Paris. Like, this will be a very different team. Some of these guys may make that roster. But most of the fellas who would have assumed they've got a shot at going to the Olympics uh, aren't going. And that goes really kind of across the board. And that's where we kind of need to get to this second part of the video, which is how we got in the situation in the first place. So... You may have noticed that FIBA now has its World Cup in a different time to when it used to have its World Cup. And the reason is pretty simple. So FIBA used to always have its World Cup in the even-numbered year that wasn't an Olympic year. So if you were still going with that, for example, and there hadn't been a pandemic, just to be clear. So we're going to imagine a world without COVID briefly. I know, I know. It would have been last year, not this year, that we'd have had this World Cup. And the reason they moved that essentially was they felt that being in the same calendar year and usually the same time of year, usually just about a month or so afterwards, as the Soccer World Cup was very bad because that drew away a lot of attention. And at its raw sense, that does make a lot of sense. That said, um, there was a trade-off. They had to choose one of two odd-numbered years. The other one would be going to the national championships for say national the the continental championships my word where am i going could have theirs every four years when they used to be every two years we will note with the women uh year, women's uh, tournaments in co across continents still every two years so you know it's not it's a men only change here not a, not an all-round change and uh, the women's world cup is now actually in the year before olympics in cycle isn't it yeah no it's, it's in the world it's men's world cup year yeah so there you go yeah it's in the men's world cup year now the women's world cup is so kind of strange that Anyway, getting back on point, you know, that thing I go off. FIBA's decision was essentially, we can't, you know, be the thing that year against the Football World Cup in the nations where basketball is largely, you know, quite successful. Obviously, some nations where basketball isn't as big also have big events, but they aren't as 
bigger distraction. Although one does stand out. For example, France will be playing, well, assuming they make it to the back end of the um, World Cup, like the championship rounds, will be playing at the same time as their national team is hosting Rugby's World Cup, which, believe me, will be a much bigger deal in France purely because of the here's and nows of hosting a major event at the same time. But the problem was suddenly you were saying, right, we want to be the year before the Olympics. And that immediately left a huge decision for those Team USA players. Did they want to commit to playing two consecutive summers? And you may go, oh, come on, that isn't a lot. You're forgetting the length of the NBA season. The basketball season as a whole is quite long, but the NBA one is the one that's relevant here because that's the one with Team USA, which is kind of dictating the tempo here in some respects. You're basically saying we want you to play two summers in a row, guys, with no rest, essentially. There's very little break for players who play international tournaments if they're playing in the NBA. There isn't even that great a break for them if they're playing, by the way, elsewhere in the world. And it's a huge commitment, and frankly, the biggest players in the sport can say, don't feel like it if they don't want to, knowing they'll still be on the plane to wherever the Olympics are. And with the USA in basketball, they're always going to be on the plane to the Olympics. There is not a situation without World War III where the USA is not qualifying for the Olympics in men's basketball. In the case of women's basketball, I can't think of a conflict big enough to prevent USA qualifying for the Olympics, such as their dominance in that. So that's the level we're at here. And the problem there is then you're immediately saying the absolute biggest names from the country where the sport is the biggest are not going to show up. That immediately sort of takes away some of the attraction, for example, for Canada. Like, would Jamal be playing if Steph was on the plane? I think he'd certainly be considering it. Like, you know, it, you know that'd be the type of battle he'd kind of go, Ooh, I kind of want that, actually. Yeah, I want to beat Steph in an international tournament. And likewise, you know, Chris Stapps, obviously he's got an injury, but would he have thought about this differently, you know, if there was a little bit of a break and admittedly if he hadn't been changing team? Possibly, yeah. Like, you know, there was a chance. Although he's probably less of an example, but the ones to really talk about here are Jokic, Giannis, and, well, everybody else who basically had lengthy playoff runs. Because for them, this is a no-brainer. You've had a long, long finish to your NBA season. Like, you know, for the guys who didn't make the playoffs then versus the guys who made the finals, it's a guts of two months difference. It's enormous, and especially in terms of rest. And if you're like Jokic and you made the NBA champion, NBA Finals, you won the NBA championship, and you know you also very openly enjoy your rest and relaxing with your horses, you kind of have earned it, you know. And like he's been the soldier for Serbia for quite a while, and he's earned a summer off because frankly, he knows that worst case scenario because of the format now, there will still be Olympic pre qualifiers next summer. He can play with Serbia in those and possibly still get them, probably, depending on the draw, still get them into the Olympics in Paris. So he would still be only playing that one summer, and he's got that. And that dribbles down across the board. It's only certain players for whom, quite often, really, like, it, the nation lives and dies by their presence. And even then, it's not a guarantee. Like, so we have the video in Jordan Clarkson that went up yesterday. That's an obvious one. Uh, Carl Anthony Towns with the Dominican Republic, hugely important for them, no doubt. Like, you know, and he knows that this matters. And... You know, as it goes on, Luca, obviously, because especially with no Dragic, no Kankar uh, for them, uh, you know, there's, there's so many examples here where it's like, yeah, they're going to have to play uh, because it's kind of necessary for them to, you know, be in that competitive spot and they might get something. Obviously, also, a lot of these guys, well, I was going to say, a lot of these guys love playing for the national team, like Larry Markkinen. But here's the thing the guys I mentioned who aren't playing also do. But basketball's got a rest issue, which hasn't been able to enable, fix in. The international game enough yet like in europe we have effectively now have a i suppose an armistice and what was a civil war where Euroleague wouldn't have games uh, so they would have games clashing directly with international qualifiers so as a result players in Euroleague would largely speaking be unavailable to play international qualifiers so yeah but the problem is it's not Euroleague and it's not FIBA. it's the very sport of basketball itself basketball is unlike pretty much every sport that has a global, global attraction. And basketball is very big overall globally in that the governing body internationally isn't, you know, overarching. Like obviously so, so in some cases there's going to be people who have more power than others. Like this UEFA FIFA battle in football is a classic one. But there's no doubt that FIBA is a very, very distant second in the power structure to the NBA. And, uh, Crucially within that, probably a third if you go with the NBPA, the union. Because as long as the NBA is essentially going to, you know, 
on a, you know, dictate the terms and it's right to, by the way, like it's only in its own best interests is what it has to act in. Uh, like, you know, we may go, but isn't that bad for the sport internationally? Yeah, but the NBA's role is growing the NBA, period. That's their thing. If growing basketball helps that, great. But only if, as in beyond the NBA, but only really if it helps the NBA, that's what unfortunately private enterprise is going to do. Like, you know, uh, old uh, lefties like me just have to accept that. And yeah, it's like, until you make it appealing to the NBA to sort of dance to those beats, it's not going to happen. We'll address that in a crazy bit at the very end of this, I promise. We have gone very long already. So, wow, we have gone really long already. My word, this is a long video. So let's get to what could happen. Okay, so the World Cup is going to have players who stand out, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be star-making moments. Like the USA team that went in 2014 didn't have the absolute best of the best, but it wasn't as big a drop, shall we say, as the one we had for 2019, actually, is a good example in terms. There was like sort of this halfway house between the Olympic squad and the not quite Olympic squad, and we ended up with this unusual thing where, not joking, it sounds crazy. Nearly ten years later, anyone who was in Bilbao came out thinking Kenneth Reed has been turned into an absolute global superstar this week, as in he's going to take over the NBA. Yes, Kenneth Reed. Anyone who got I was around the group phase, and by the end of the uh, finals. You know, we were kind of going, well, at least he made the old tournament, but he probably should have got MVP over Kyrie. Again, straight face, these were things we believe. And obviously, Kenneth didn't really turn out to be what we thought he was going to be in basketball. And star making from international tournaments is no guarantee. Like, the guys who have, you know, been these stars in international tournaments that were also stars in the NBA or in Europe, pretty much had it made before they did it in national colors. Like, you know, Nikos Galas, for example, the great Greek, he was doing it as a star in Greece. He just elevated the whole sport of basketball while he did a Eurobasket for them. But, um, you know, look at the Hernan Gomez brothers last year in Eurobasket for the prime example. Juancho was uh, MVP of the final, and like Bo Cruz, his character, you know, uh, from the movie was uh, trending worldwide. And everybody's going, oh my god, Bo Cruz, cool. Uh, and then w w Willie was MVP of the tournament. And both of them are now out of the NBA a full year later. Just it, it's incredible to think about. So it doesn't like just because, you know, you can be looking like the 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 G in an international tournament does not mean you're going to be you know carrying that on to the next level or even have the situation where you can carry that on to the next level. So if we're going to solve this, um, there is the thing that would work, and then there's the things that might actually be considered acceptable. And um, they're two very different things. What would work is never going to actually be passed, because I mentioned the MBPA for a reason, and I'm a union man at heart. You'd need to convince them and the NBA that, and this is extremely silly, just so we're clear, this is not happening, but this is what you would need to do for to make it happen. To introduce international breaks, windows, in the regular season. Now, you know that's not happening, but this is what would need to happen to really address this. And that would make people want to be involved with their national teams. And obviously, you have to say challenge for Team USA in that the level of competition it would be facing in qualifiers, etc. Aside from the games against Canada, really, at the moment, would be substantial in terms of the gulf. Like, you know, the Americas right now is at the strongest continent when it comes to basketball. Argentina's probably not going to the Olympics, uh, didn't, isn't going to this World Cup, despite getting silvers at the last World Cup. And like Canada is obviously coming on strong, but you can build a USA Canada rivalry, but you oddly have a similar situation to what CONCACAF has in football, only massively accelerated and far greater. So that's what you would need to do, and that way you'd have your NBA players coming over to Europe during the season and going around the world. It would never pass because the insurance alone, never mind convincing the MBPA, not happening, not happening. So what else do you need? Well, okay, that won't work. So what can work? And it's essentially looking at, well, how do we make it less of a load for players who are going into international tournaments. So you build it around rest. Now, what exactly you do, I don't know, being blunt. But you've got to look at a way of how to reshape these tournaments to be more rest-suited. And oddly, your best bet, really, is going back up against the Football World Cup. Because you're losing them for the year before the Olympics anyway. That's been established from the last two World Cup cycles. But it's not like you're getting a huge audience demo growth here in your core markets. And if you think about your growth markets, like with China last time, we're, you know, in, in the islands of Asia this time, for want of a better way of putting it. And 
it's like those places are still gonna go crazy for whatever year it's held in their countries it's like that's gonna happen yeah run it back I know it sounds silly but run it back because unless you do that continental tournaments are gonna remain far bigger deals because there's far more rest involved with them than any World Cup will because the bottom line is players value an Olympic gold over a World Cup gold and if you want players to turn up for the World Cup it can't involve them ruining a summer before the Olympic summer. Well, that's it. I've gone on for far too long. If you want to learn about one star who isn't the star you're expecting, but the one I think will oddly be the most important player, not most valuable, but most important player at the World Cup, video with him, Jordan Clarkson, is up there somewhere. Well, about him. I didn't get to talk to Jordan in person, just to be clear. And of course, like I said at the start, please subscribe. It really, really helps. Thank you, and I'll be back soon.